Pyrrhus decided to recreate the Roman army of the latter half of the first century AD, 50 AD to 100 AD, which encompasses the invasion of Britain, is the idea. We portray the uh, last year of the reign of Emperor Vespasian, which is 79 AD. So this is in the Flavian period. It's purely amateur. We needed to raise some funds for a, a village hall, and we made eight suits of armour. And um, we raised the funds for the, the village hall. It started building, and we thought, well, it's silly to throw the armour away. What can we do with it? And so we thought we could form a Roman group. So we, we formed a, a permanent group. The Roman army was the legionary soldier. His equipment, to a certain extent, is dictated. I got into it through an interest in the Romans. I saw the Ermine Street Guard on display nine years ago, and I wrote off to Chris and. Uh, and uh, got invited to a display, did, did one day, and was thinking, well, what else shall I do on my weekends? <laughs> well, I got into it because I wanted a suit of armour, and joining a Roman group gets you a suit of armour and a good reason to wear it. And when I got into it, I found how interesting it was, and it just took off from there. Really, my interest started because I was interested in history, and my feeling is that the history, certainly of the Roman history, as it was taught to me when I was at school, wasn't say very well put over for what the, what you consider 400 years of our history it wasn't much at all we can't say we're exactly as they were but it gives a better idea let's say rather than the drawings in a book which is all I had when I went to school was somebody's artistic representation you might say of what a Roman soldier looked like. The Roman army was a professional army one of the first in the world this is their men's job and the biggest problem with the professional army is you have to turn the farmhand into the soldier and the way the Romans did this was training. We don't portray a, a Roman unit uh, larger than a century, so we don't have any higher officers and things like that. So it's just a, like a detachment of the Roman army to like, the tent parties of, of the Roman army, with a few auxiliaries and two cavalry. I'm in the equipment of a Roman centurion. Uh, centurions always wear their crests across the helmet from side to side in a transverse manner. Um, they generally are in male shirts or scale shirts. They're the only ones who wear greaves on their legs as a badge of rank. I've got medals called Valerie on my chest which are being awarded for valour in battle, as are the torques on the shoulders. And I also always carry a vine stick for, uh, as a badge of office and also used for discipline on the men. For offensive fighting, carry a short stabbing gladius, like so, which is much shorter and lighter than the Celtic sword and used rather more like a bayonet or a dagger. And basically you just stick it into the stomach of the enemy because three or four inches of it into the stomach will kill. In Roman times if you got a stomach wound it was invariably fatal. That was the main form of defence. When you get armies packed together the big slashing swords are very difficult to use because you need room to swing them. The short stabbing sword you don't need hardly any room at all to use. You see, most of the protection is on my shoulders and my head. It's because the people we're fighting, the Celts on the whole, use large slashing swords to attack on the top of the head. So a lot of my armour's up here, which is why my legs aren't particularly aren't armoured, because you simply didn't attack that area with those sorts of swords. It gives you a sense of touch with the history, uh, which you don't get off watching the television off, off the internet. Whereas when people come to a display like this and they can talk to people who are dressed as Roman soldiers and get some idea of what Roman life was like in the army. The public do like to get a handle on things, to actually touch and feel items and see things live. For dropping on the ground, scatter them out, and you've always got a spike up. And they'd be used in battlefields or on roads to slow down the enemy. That one as well, which is the big brother of them, should be hammered into the ground and let, that's left sticking out. You can imagine running across the field, especially in bare feet, and with a fish hook as well. You're not going anywhere after being stapled onto that, so uh, you're immediately in trouble. It's real, you know, they can almost participate in it, you know, they, they can handle it and get involved with it almost. Uh, people can come along and see uh, various items in, in our encampment. So they're not just seeing the equipment, they're also seeing the, the daily life of a soldier on campaign, the type of food they had, the medical care, the different probes for taking spearheads out, etc. The doctor would come along and go after it with one of these. 
and then you try and sterilise it. So you heat this up to red hot, and you'd put that in the whole zone, try and burn the whole thing, yeah, and stir it, and try and cauterise it. Yeah. But we do happen to know that they liked cauterisation. They thought it was a great way of curing things, including hiccups and diarrhoea. So. Well, would you believe <laughs> the Irma Street Guard worked closely with um, academics, archaeologists, to perfect their equipment. So over time, that equipment has been uh, developed with new finds. So we're always refining the items and equipment that we have as new research finds how it's been used or whether what we've actually reconstructed is, is incorrect because they found something else that proves what we've done is incorrect now. Before we started doing this, people had only a vague idea of how the armour went together and how the equipment worked. And it's only by producing it, wearing it and trying to use it you actually find out what works and what doesn't. It's a real sense of achievement to, to make these things, to research them and to see them in use and to find out about things. The academics come and talk to us. You know, we give them as much information, almost as much information as they give us. And also it's great to see people coming along here, members of the public, and seeing things they've only either seen on films or again in, in school books before, you know, come on alive and, and see how it a little get a taste of how it was. It is, I suppose, to a certain extent aimed at the children because we do do school visits as well as what we do that you've seen here today. And I think the whole combined effort, let's say, has a great deal to, uh, to improve, let's say, the education of our children and our history uh, that they didn't use to get. Well, the Romans were actually in, in Britain for 400 years, so it's quite a long time to have that kind of cultural contact. There is quite a large Roman influence. It influences our architecture, our language. There's an awful lot of Latin in English. The road system um, and a lot of our ways of life and things, our laws and uh, a lot of um, things that we do, parts of our language, etc., all influenced by, by the Roman architecture occupation of Britain. As the Romans tried to use their civilization to pacify the local tribes, uh, the Romanization involved uh, introducing the locals to luxury items, etc. And by that way, uh, they could forget about their warlike nature. This is part of the personal hygiene routine of your average uh, yes, Roman soldier. I, I, I know of that's right. <laughs> no toilet paper in the Roman army, so you'd have all of these sat in a little jar of vinegar. Yes, Pop it out, and then when you were finished the doing your business. Out, well, the Romans civilised us and taught us that being one country was a good thing. If you look at a lot of countries in Europe, they were little countries and they got invaded and beaten up a lot. But because England was historically one country, because of the Romans, we didn't get beaten up and invaded much. And by this time, even the soldiers weren't all Italians. They were given citizenship to uh, many ex-soldiers, so you'd have had people from France and Germany in the ranks as legionaries, as citizen soldiers. And um, in another 20 years of the Emperor Hadrian, then you had non-Italian emperors. He was Spanish. And imagine yourself to be the Celtic enemy. The past is interesting because it's an unsolved puzzle. We don't know everything about the Roman period and it's interesting to discuss and reconstruct and actually explore things that people haven't done before. It's getting far more popular, especially on the continent. You know, we, we get a, quite a good welcome in France and Belgium, Spain, you know, terrific crowds. This is the 30th anniversary of this particular society and when it started off, um, almost no one else did this. We were the first Roman group and one of the first groups to reenact any period. And now there are over a dozen Roman groups in Britain alone. Um, and there seem to be more and the crowds get larger. Um, it certainly uh, seems to be getting more and more popular.